This evening I have the pleasure and the privilege to introduce um, Professor Catherine Gibson from the University of Western Sydney. Um, over the last 20 years, I think it's quite safe to say that Catherine has transformed our very understanding of economies with the influence of her work extending far beyond her own field of geography into urban development, art, architecture, sociology, econ economics, politics, and continues to have ramifications into every sphere of activity and everyday life. She's most known for her co-authored work with the late Julie Graham under their collective pen name of J.K. Gibson Graham. Their work, particularly um, their books, The End of Capitalism as We Knew It, published 20, nearly 20 years ago in 1996, and A Post-Capitalist Politics, published in 2006, brought feminist critiques of political economy in which they deconstructed the notion of a single monolithic economy, the economy, which is so dominant in our lives, discourse, and imaginations for the future. They brought instead the notion of diverse economies, a multiplicity of economies they argue are already present, if only we can recognise them. So J.K. Gibson Graham and their colleagues at the Community Economies Collective and Community Economies Research Network are elaborating and enacting new visions of the economy in the here and now. Their most recent work has included Take Back the Economy, which is a practical guide for communities who want to bring about ethical and economic transformations in the places where we live. And they have also launched a new book series at Minnesota Press, dedicated to diverse economies, testament to this growing field of activity, research and practice. I think in Catherine's research, her writing, and in her practices on the ground of local and regional development, there is something both deeply ethical and deeply empowering. It's a unique approach that she brings in which she brings an ethical orientation to every encounter with each idea, each person, and each situation, as I hope you will see. So, in order to participate today from Sydney, Catherine has recorded a lecture for us especially. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to Skype her because it's two o'clock in the morning. Um, but I think, I hope to show you the video, and I think we should have time maybe for a little discussion at the end. So, thank you. Hello there on the other side of the world. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak to you during this conference on architecture and resilience on a human scale. I hope you've all enjoyed the first session and it's um, great to be meeting with you in this way. I'd like to thank Kim Trogel for her introduction and also for helping to arrange my virtual presence here with you. And also Doina Petroscu and Irena Bauman for connecting me to you all at this conference. So the last time I spoke at University of Sheffield, um, there was a fire evacuation during the middle of the seminar that I was involved in and much disruption ensued as the audience and speakers had to go down 10 floors to the outside while the culprit toaster and burnt toast was, was located by the fire brigade. Um, hopefully this time I'm relying on global communications and technologies that work and fingers crossed the session will go smoothly and we can have some interaction after this short lecture. So in the time that I have, I want to propose that building resilience at a human scale must be linked to reconfiguring how we think about economy and ecology and their relationship. Shortly before her death in 2008, feminist eco-philosopher Val Plumwood wrote of the need to go onwards in a different mode of humanity if we are to survive the ecological crisis that humans have produced. Not long after that, Dipesh Chakrabarti suggested that in a climate changing world of today, we humans are being called to act as a species within the multi-species community of life on this planet. Both thinkers hint at a need to reconfigure how we understand humanity. To my mind, their calls push us to ask can we overcome our hyper-separation from the more than human world and take up membership in a thoroughly ecological community of life? Given the focus of this conference, we could add, and what might taking up membership in a thoroughly ecological community of life mean for resilience? In my work, both as J.K. Gibson Graham and as a member of the Community Economies Collective and Research Network, I've largely focused on rethinking the economy 
as a site of ethical interdependence between humans. But in the years since Val's death, I've begun the task of addressing the hyper-separation of humans from the more than human world. And I've embarked on this task with others. A small book of mini essays has just appeared in which community economies and environmental humanities scholars broached the question of, ethic, of an ethics for living in the Anthropocene. And we approach this not from a philosophical standpoint invested in establishing moral norms and precepts, but with an interest in everyday doings, in the collective practices of preserving life, both human and non-human. The book was published this year by Punctum Books under a Creative Commons license, and you can download the PDF for free or make a donation and buy the book in paper form. So the book starts with a tentative manifesto, and tentatively then, not declaratively, as perhaps a manifesto should be, our manifesto calls for experimental and open thinking in service of life. Thinking that listens to the world and gives up delusions of mastery and control. It calls for stories that enact connectivity and move us to concern and action. And it advocates research that goes on beyond critical analysis to forge new methods that excavate encounter and extend reparative possibilities. Research that opens up multiple pathways for alternative futures. I'm sharing this manifesto with you today, as for me, our book and the manifesto that we started with encapsulate some of the steps that we might want to take to enact resilience in both our thinking and practice. These steps include resituating humans within ecological systems, and resituating non-humans in ethical terms. It includes recognising and strengthening systems of survival that are resilient in the face of change and attending to diversity and dynamism in ecologies and economies. It includes recognising ethical responsibilities across space and time, between places and in the future, and creating new ecological economic narratives. So in this talk, I want to focus on how we might cultivate ethical, ecological, economic sensibilities. And here I'll be drawing on the essay from the book that I co-authored with Ethan Miller. And I hope then to go on and give a glimmer of what it might, what it might be involved in strengthening economic resilience at a human scale in monsoon Asia. But before we start cultivating these new sensibilities, I need to rec we need to recognise that uh, the many ways that mainstream visions of the capitalist economy stand in the way of building resilience. I'll use the cover uh, image on the Turkish translation of our book, The End of Capitalism as We Knew It, a feminist critique of political economy, to illustrate the points that I want to make. And um, I was delighted, in a way, with the, the image that uh, the Turks found for this book, with um, the Goliath of capitalism there, being attacked by Julie and I with our little stones and slings. So what stands in the way of building resilience? Well, when the economy is seen as a distinct sphere of human activity, as somehow marked off from the social, the political and the ecological, as a domain of individualised, monetized, rational, maximising calculation, that is, when the economy is seen as a machine that runs society, the base or the bottom line, this, this image stands in the way of building resilience. And here the image is represented in the robot's workings, this mechanical kind of machine, machinic ro robot. What also stands in the way is when the economy is positioned as a sphere that rests upon and utilises an earthly base of often very invisible ecologies uh, that when swept up into its domain become resources, that is passive inputs for production and consumption, that are measured primarily by their market value. And here in this image, it's what our robot is biting into, our earth. It also stands, the representation also stands in the way of building resist, re resilience when the economy is naturalized in the sense that it's presented as a realm of objective law-like processes and demands, in the sense that it affirms the more than human world as somehow external to our economic lives and renders invisible and unaccountable the complexities of our social and ecological interdependencies. And finally, when the economy assumes a presence and a dynamism 
for instance, the demand for endless growth, that appears to be somehow independent from the living world upon which it depends. So enabling as these kind of interconnected visions of economy may have historically been for some, this view of economy-ecology relations now stands squarely in the way of imagining and enacting an economic ethics for living in the Anthropocene. This mainstream discourse of economy has, in the past, literally made sense, transforming our sensual perceptions and experiences, altering the conditions of possibility for our identifications with others, and changing our abilities to see, think and feel certain interrelationships and the responsibilities that come with such experiences. And here I'm brought to mind um, uh, this installation I was just recently in the Bauhaus Dessau Heritage Site in Germany and two young architects had uh, put this installation into the, the little bit of kind of domesticated nature that's in between the buildings of the Bauhaus site there. Um, and this is really bringing to visibility the way that nature has somehow been tamed by modernism. Part of this hyper separation that I'm trying to challenge. So. Our challenge then is to engage in forms of thought and practice that undermine the conditions of possibility for thinking the economy as a hyper-separated domain beyond the reach of politics, ethics and the dynamics of social and ecological interdependence. The thought experiment that I want to engage in today is to see the economy as ecology, as a subset of human ecological behaviours no longer bounded, but fully integrated into a complex flow of ethical and energetic interdependencies of births, contaminations, self-organising, mergings, extinctions, pattern, habitat maintenance and destruction. My question is, how might we reconfigure our notions of economy and ecology in ways that help us take responsibility for being alive together as life? So in the essay that I'm basing this talk on, we suggest three different strategies. One is to rethink being, another is to redefine economy, and third is to propose ethical coordinates for more than human community economies. But today I'll only have time to discuss rethinking being, and I'll try to illustrate the other strategies by introducing you to a research project I've embarked upon in Monsoon Asia. Okay, so rethinking being. For political theorist Jean-Luc Nancy, the individual emerges from an essential sociality rather than the other way around, as is often conceived. He suggests that we replace the singular philosophical conception of being with being in common. A being in common that does not reduce us to a unity or a shared essence. For theorists of evolutionary biology, Lynn Margulis, the process of symbiogenesis suggests that individuals are all diversities of co-evolving associates. Life does not exist without community, as a process of connection amidst, amidst difference. Um, that is, life doesn't exist then without being in common. Life, writes Margulis and Sagan, is an orgy of attractions. So if we cease to think of ourselves as singular, self-contained beings and begin to identify with, for example, the multiple communities of bacteria and bacterial symbionts from which we continually take shape and of which we are fleeting but temporary manifestations, as, for instance, proposed by Myra Hurd, or when we place our activities in the context of a billions of years old emergent planetary scale process of biological self-regulation, it's no longer possible to fully identify with humanity as a distinctive ontological uh, category set apart from all else. What difference might it make if we accept that from the scale of Gaia to the scale of the microscopic bacteria that form the labouring basis for nearly all biological energy production and transformation, there is a we bound together in myriad interrelationships that are themselves the very conditions of existence for our sense of a human we. Being in common, that is, community, can no longer be thought of or felt as a community of humans alone. It must become 
multi-species community that includes all of those with whom our livelihoods are interdependent and interrelated. From this standpoint, there is no ground, there's no more ground for the construction of a human economy separate from its ecological context than there would be for ecologists to consider the provisioning practices of bees as an independent system with its own internal laws and imperatives wholly separate from their constitutive interrelationships with flowering plants, other pollinators, soil mycorrhizae, nitrogen fixing bacteria, seed dispersing birds and mammals. So human sociality is simply a particular manifestation of the mutual interrelationships between and among species and between and among communities of living beings that implicate lives ranging from micro mitochondria in our cells to pollinators that make agriculture possible. If, to paraphrase Foucault, there is no outside to ecology, the big difference between those who have an economy and those who don't is our symbolic capacity to represent ourselves as constituting a distinct sphere of existence in which sociality is reduced to individual desire. In other words, we're separate only by virtue of our ability to conceive of these separations. We might say from a Gaian perspective that we humans are a manifestation of the self-organising system of planetary life that is experimenting with self-consciousness. Certainly this makes members of our species distinctive and allows us to generate previously impossible ecologies. But by thinking and building ourselves into self-conscious separation from ecological interrelationships and the sociality of life, we have made many of our livelihood processes into the enemy, the enemies of ecological resilience. Our acknowledgement of this history and our commitment to rejoining a community of life through both our concepts and our actions is a crucial step towards a more robust ethical engagement with the world. So let me try and illustrate what this rethinking of being might mean for researching resilience in monsoon Asia. The frequency and magnitude of typhoons and cyclones, flooding and landslides has risen dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years. And this time span has coincided with an unprecedented population growth in South and Southeast Asia, or the region of monsoon Asia. In the Philippines where I've worked, for example, population has doubled since the early 1980s when I first started researching there, from 50 million to 100 million. Over this same time period, there's been a rapid urbanisation with both modern urban development and its accompanying slum development producing ma a man-made environment that is regularly at war with ecological resilience. And this graph shows the urban populations in these countries. Um, and to the left, the bar shows the proportion of urban populations that live in slums. So see, for example, the devastating effects of the tropical storm Ondoy in Metro Manila in 2009. This is a, flood, a photo of the flood ranging through, raging through the landscape, wiping away settlements along the riverbanks. And this is um, the picture after the water subsided. There's an urgent need for resilient forms of habitation and livelihood to be strengthened. Yet urban growth and economic development in monsoon Asia shows little sign of departing from a Western model of industrial and consumption oriented development that has degraded environments and led to the climate crisis. In the immediate aftermath of crises such as Typhoon Ondoy, community economic practices of mutual support and assistance are immediately ac activated. Long before state or NGO sponsored aid arrives, People share scarce resources, they rescue each other and their possessions, and they begin to build, rebuild shelters. In the Philippines, as elsewhere across monsoon Asia, there's a rich diversity of economic relations that coexist alongside more formal, monetized market relations. But what we might call an ecology of interdependent community economic relationships has largely been ignored or more accurately, delegitimized by Western knowledge systems. Where these practices have been acknowledged, 
they've been lumped into categories that highlight their separation from modern economic practice. So for instance, we see terms like uh, shared poverty or patronage or the moral economy of the peasant. In the familiar discursive framing of capital centrism, these practices are positioned as the opposite of, as the subordinate to, or a complement to capitalist economic relations. In our research, we've used the iceberg to note, denote the ways that what sustains lives for the world's majority is often excluded from mainstream economic discourse. And in our work in the Pacific, we've modified the iceberg representation here to use the floating coconut to illustrate the vast diversity of practices that sustain lives that are not part of the mainstream economy. But in the Philippines, there's a vast, and in many other places of the world, there's a vast and diverse vocabulary of non-capitalist economic relations that can be documented. And our project is interested in scouring archives, old geographies and ethnographies, and talking to people today to produce an alternative economic geography of monsoon Asia, an alternative vision of this ecology of community economic practices that coexist and still exists in many regions. And here are some of the terms, the distinctive language that is used to name these kinds of community economic practices. Environmental historian Greg Bankoff's research on the Philippines demonstrates, interestingly, a correlation between the density of associations and these kinds of community economic practices and the areas of the country that have historically suffered the most frequent extreme weather events. This kind of research suggests an intriguing relationship between climate conditions and economic diversity that we're eager to explore further. A kind of co-development or co-production, perhaps. With climate change, the monsoon is now changing its force and trajectory. Many er areas um, that have not co-evolved with monsoon weather conditions are now subject to its force. At the same time, there's a rethinking of what the monsoon is, no longer only from the perspective of the people and landscapes it affects, but from this complex interrelationship of oceans and land masses, of ecologies of social and economic organisation, and other lively communities of vegetation and animal life. That is, there's thinking of what we might call a monsoon assemblage. This is a very simple but groundbreaking proposition as it opens up the possibility that the monsoon assemblage could potentially be reconfigured. Following from this is the idea that the changing monsoon in the Anthropocene might be something to co-produce rather than merely adapt to. In this framing, design must be seen as something that both human and non-human agents do, and that the energies to be harnessed are at the same time intellectual and material, man-made and earth-made. What might be the implications for architecture and resilience then? As we extend our analysis from diverse economic practices to diverse more than human relationships, we keep stumbling across the central role that bamboo has played, played in monsoon Asia. Here, of course, it's seen as a flotation device for rescue in the context of typhoons and flooding. But it's also used as a flotation device for houses that rise and fall with the floods, um, as we shown, as I see in this picture, and also as a resource in, uh, for livelihoods in post-crisis situations here it's used to build um, container st stands for container food gardens in Metro Manila in the aftermath of tropical cyclone um, and typhoon Ondoy. The modern hyper-separation of economy from ecology has severed many of the ties that people have had with bamboo over the past 50 years. But there's renewed interest in working with bamboo in new ways in high-tech ways to try and look at it, uh, its role in new kinds of structural engineering, and also in low-tech ways, as we see here in a, a typhoon proof house built of, of bamboo in Vietnam. So just to conclude my brief comments, if community is what emerges as living beings make and share worlds together, then community economies are the sites where we imagine and struggle as increasingly attentive members of a community of life, to balance our needs with the needs of others, to account for and to offer recompense for the gifts of surplus we receive from the earth 
and earth others, and to begin to build together an ethical practice of economy for living in and beyond the Anthropocene. In monsoon Asia, the first step towards strengthening resilience at a human scale involves appreciating the long-standing social and ecological relationships that have supported life over the millennia, revaluing them and working with them to produce new livable futures. So thanks very much for your attention and I hope that we can have a bit of interchange now uh, through Skype.